All right, hi and welcome. We are finally on our last book of the semester. I decided to end with Harry Potter um, for a couple of reasons. First, I wanted something a little bit lighter, hopefully familiar and really fun to end our semester with. Uh, especially while you are or should be spending some time working on your final projects. Um, so hopefully this is a really fun read for us to finish our semester off with. Um, I could revisit our discussion here that we had in Unit 1 about reading YA literature in, in a college classroom. Um, because I'll admit again that, uh, you know, there was a little bit of hesitation on my side about putting Harry Potter on the syllabus. Is that serious enough? Is that okay for a, a respectable college class? Um, but we very much had that, dis that discussion went over it, that even if something's written for children, right? Um, and my son read this book when he was in first grade. And he was seven so um, you know even very young children can read it but there is still so much so so much in these books even in these earlier books um, the that where they're clearly much more YA lots and lots of stuff to talk about which leads me to my second reason that I chose to have us read Harry Potter um, it's because there's so much in this magic system about language uh, and so much in this world about um, writing and books that's uh, really interesting and a lot of things to talk about. Um, so next week we'll have our more full discussion about bookish items in this world. Um, so uh, keep your eye out for those sorts of things um, uh, thinking about the, the use of books in this book. In this story and um, we'll talk about that next week but this week we'll keep our discussion focused just on um, more of the language aspect both spoken and a little bit written um, but thinking about how language works in this world and in this magic system so I hope that those of you who have not ventured into the realm of Harry Potter before were able to read book one first um, before diving into book two here um, you gotta you gotta read them all at some point in my personal opinion but um hope you were able to at least get book one in beforehand um and i will say that for the purposes of speaking about spells uh, book two actually isn't the best i i definitely chose book two more for our bookish discussion next week um so at least in the first half that we read for today there's only maybe a handful of spells spoken out loud um, most are just mentioned in passing without mentioning the spell itself, um, but in the magic system as a whole, um, spells are very important. Obviously though, they're not the only part of this magic system. In a Wizard of Earthsea, words, names, um, spells, those were, that was basically it for the magic system. But in this Harry Potter world, um, it's more than just spells, right? We've got potions, we've got um, herbology, we've got divination, we've got um, care of magical creatures. So the, there's these other parts to the magic system um, that are not necessarily founded in language. Um, and we'll just talk about this for a second though, because I still wanna bring up some of these questions that we've explored in some of our other um, books or about magic systems about um, what makes something magical or where does the power come from so I will uh, I will say right now that there is a whole Harry Potter fandom out there um, and a deep deep world of, of Harry Potter lore um, some of it canonical, as in J.K. Rowling has written about it and clarified things and, and, and deep lore there and um, others I don't know. And I have not done any research into that world of, of like deep Harry Potter lore or fandom. Not really a part of it. I've only read the seven books, so that's what I'm working with. So some of these questions that I bring up or raise, um, they may have answers somewhere out there in the world of Harry Potter fandom. And if you know those answers, feel free to chime in on them. 
Um, but uh, the first question I want to talk about is, right, what makes a magician powerful in this world? Um, we had this debate in Wizard of Earth Sea. Was it just knowing the words? Was it knowing the names? If you knew the name of something, that's what gave you the power to control it. So in that case, it's either the language itself that's powerful, coupled with the knowledge. Knowledge of that language is powerful. But there were still these hints that Ged was an unusually gifted one, so maybe there was some innate ability. Um, in this world, though, it seems pretty clear that the power is innate, right? The magic is um, inside the wizard. You're born with it. You're, you're born with the ability to become a powerful wizard. And obviously knowledge plays a huge part, right? Um, the more you learn in this world, the more you grow. That's why they're all at school, <laughs> okay? Um, but um, the magic does seem to be inside, right? Or, or inside the person. Um, but then thinking about those other magical topics we have, uh, just just to throw this idea, idea out here, right? If we have magical creatures, what makes those creatures magical? Um, they're not necessarily wizard creatures performing magic like humans are, but something about them is magical? But like, how do we define that? Or how does Rowling define it? She probably has somehow, somewhere. Um, but uh, is it just because they are historically considered magical creatures. Um, there's, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a, a whole bunch of explanations about what makes something magical. Probably again the idea though that they're born that way. Um, something inside the creature themselves that makes them magical. Um, but the, like take it one step further again with the idea of potions or plants that have these magical properties. And I feel like that gets a little bit trickier too, because what makes these plants or these these objects, these things out in nature, what makes them magical? Uh, rather than just medicine or just, you know, like, right? What's, what's the line there? Um, and their wands, like the wands have a core of something. Um, and uh, I mean like a dragon core or a unicorn core, whatever, right? So those are like magical creatures. But again, what, what makes them magical, right? What, uh, is it innate in the substance itself? Um, where's the power coming from? And I think in this Harry Potter world, one of the answers we're gonna get to is uh, that sometimes the power is just um, historical convention, all right? At least for thinking about the, the creation of these things, okay? Um, all right, so we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time, again, exploring what makes these animals or plants or even inanimate objects magical, um, but we are gonna talk about language. We're gonna focus on the language used and what makes this language system magical, what makes spells um, spoken, sometimes just thought though, sometimes even just thinking the spell, uh, but what makes that magical? So I hope you enjoyed the article that I had you read. Um, it came, it came out of this book called Harry Potter and History, um, which just back to my earlier point about, uh, YA books being legitimate for a college classroom. Look, if you've got legit scholars, and these are legit, like, professors at universities, like well-known in their field scholars writing about Harry Potter, well, then it's legit, okay? <laughs> um, this is, this is good stuff. Um, also, I just, <laughs> before we dive into this article, I really want to apologize for the spoilers, especially for those of you who have not read the rest of the series. I really hope for those of you who don't want to be spoiled that you skip page 47 because it's a pretty massive spoiler. Whew. Um, and I tried to warn you, so I hope you were able to avoid that. Um, but how many of you have ever thought deeply before about the um, linguistic and etymology origins of these spells, about the idea of them coming from Latin or from Greek? 
um, or from Germanic languages and that influencing the level or the power of the spell. Um, so I don't actually know if J.K. Rowling studied linguistics or language in school or anything like that, but it's clear that she knows some stuff. All right, uh, I'm guessing she had at least some Latin, uh, very likely, right? Um, so the first question to think about here is why is Latin considered a language of power? Why are these powerful spells uh, derived from Latinate terms? Um, and some really interesting stuff here um, that uh, Latin is, so, so talking about the history of Latin, right, that Latin is uh, still the language of the church, but increasingly was a language understood only by those with an education. It became the language of the powerful, the language of scholars, wise men and clerics. The people understood what was said in church less and less. Um, what's that the priest is saying, one farmer might say to another? Don't know, his friend might shrug, just the same old hocus pocus. Uh, wasn't that fascinating about the origin of the term hocus pocus from the Latin mass? Um, hoc est inum corpus meum. No idea if that's how you actually say it, but um, a, a vernacular ear hearing that not speaking Latin sort of uh, shortens it down into something like hocus pocus. Sounds like hocus pocus to me. Sounds like that mysterious, powerful Latin language we hear at church but don't actually understand. Um, so, okay, the foundation stone of any magical universe is Latin. Latin means power, the power of the empire, the power of the church. And Latin means mystery, the province of the educated who huddled in their monastic libraries, learning ancient secrets and communing with the long dead. It also means formal speech. Um, right, so, the, like, while this is true in real life, right? Language, Latin is this language of power. Latin's the language of the educated, right? Why is it true for this magic system? Um, why does political power, human, or we'll call it muggle, muggle political power um, of the Roman Empire and then the, the, the um, again, we'll call it muggle again, uh, power of the church, of using Latin in the church setting, um, what does that have to do with actual magical power? And I'm going to throw this discussion back to, if you remember, all the way back to Plato and Saussure, right? Back when we were talking about um, words and whether words, um, remember, whether they were essentially connected to the things that they were naming or whether they were just convention. Remember that term convention, meaning just everyone, we all just agree that that's what the word means. Um, so we can pull that out from the word level and apply it to a language system as a whole, right? Uh, again, that, that question is, so is Latin essentially powerful? Is Latin as a language magically powerful? Um, or is it conventionally powerful? Meaning that we just associate it with power. Um, and Obviously, that's got to be part of the answer, right? That Latin is powerful because of what Rome did. Latin is powerful because of um, the centuries afterward, when after Rome, when it was used by the elite and the educated, or it was the language of mystery in the church. It was this dead language that nobody actually spoke, but um, but it was still used by the powerful uh, in law or in. In politics or, or wherever um, Latin was the language of power and uh, but this is all a social construction right it's culturally inscribed meaning on language as a whole nothing about Latin itself is inherently powerful per se right and yet this cultural consciousness of Latin being powerful and of Latinate words in English sounding more formal sounding more powerful than Germanic words, right? He, he brings up, um, oh, I'm not going to find it right now, that idea that we, we, go to, we go to work in Latin and we come home to English or to 
to Germanic languages because um, our French derived words, our Latinate words in English, they sound more formal, they sound more fancy, they sound um, more powerful and our Germanic home, hearth, whatever words, they're more comfortable, they're, they're um, less, less formal, less powerful, right? Um, so that is so ingrained in the language itself that even when children, even when small children read these books, they can understand that these spells are special um, because they sound powerful, right? It may not be, I mean, like in the story, it's real magical power, but in our experience of reading the story, it's the power of convention, of socially constructed meanings, of us being able to hear those words and we can hear the sound of power. We hear the sound of power, right? And it makes sense that these spells work. Okay. Um, then the article gets into the unforgivable curses, which again, I apologize to anyone who hasn't read the rest of the series yet because the unforgivable curses don't show up until book four. So, you know, all of this is a little bit spoilery, but can we just talk about Abracadabra for a second? Because who else found that super interesting and fascinating, right? Um, that, that Abracadabra is this really ancient, um, Middle Eastern origin word that's been associated with magic for like since before the Roman Empire. Um, and I know that uh, brought up, there was several different possibilities for what this means, this term means, um, how it may have had to do with the number nine, um, or it may, there may have been things in there having to do with confusing uh, the spirits or the devils who were trying to read it. I thought that was pretty interesting. But of course, the um, explanation that I hope is true, the one that I like the most is, and they said that um, avra kadavra means something like, I will make as I say. Um, or this idea that the connection between saying and making is an ancient one and a deeply magical idea. The idea that utterance of a word creates a physical reality. Um, it's also a deeply religious idea contained in the ancient Hebrew blessing. Blessed is he who spoke and the world was. So going back to our idea of speech acts, that um, saying magical spells are just like the ultimate speech acts, right? And this one might be an expression of that. I have said it, therefore let it be. Um, now obviously in Rowling's case, a very dark purpose um, of destruction and letting someone die. But um, still, super fascinating history on Abracadabra there, right? Um, we just, I, I love that, we perceive that language has this power to, and you speak it and it will affect the whole world, not just the human world. All right, now that brings us to the idea of pronunciation that I wanna talk about. So, um, I had you watch the clip, it's, it's from book one, um, but uh, Wingardium Leviosa, right? This is basically an iconic meme at this point, um, but it's the idea that it's not just the words you say, it's how you say them, right? That matters. And so my question for us to think about here is who gets to decide, right? Latin's a dead language, no one actually speaks it, so uh, we can only make guesses about how to actually produce Latin words. Um, we don't actually know how they, how they spoke them. So, so now what we get are British actors um, speaking these Latin spells, which makes sense. It is a British um, author who wrote this book. It takes place in Britain. So it's fine that they all have British accents, but then what happens when um, American witches and wizard, wizards show up and start speaking these spells. And like, I know that there's a whole American, I know that there's like international wizards, like we, we get there, um, magical beasts and where to find them, that whole movie spinoff, whatever that I, I have seen them, but yes. Uh, but I don't, I don't, so I don't know. I, maybe the fandom uh, addresses this. Maybe this question gets talked about somewhere, but, um, uh, is, pronunciation stable in this magic system? Do the Americans have to pronounce it the same way as the Brits and, and vice versa? Or like, how do these spells work in different languages, right? 
Um, it's it's a good question. So uh, do we do we all have to say them exactly the same way? And who who gets to decide and why? Like, is it the magic itself? Is the magic itself deeply involved in deciding how these things get to be pronounced in order to be enacted? Um, so the example of pronunciation mattering that I'll bring up from this book, Chamber of Secrets, is when Harry travels by flu powder, right? Um, and that was a that's a fun debacle where you have to speak really clearly with all this magic powder powder in your face and you're in a fire and whatnot. And um, and if the magic can hear you speak it clearly, then you'll end up in the right place, right? Well, obviously Harry messes it up, he stutters, and even though what he stutters sounds absolutely nothing like Nocturne Alley, he ends up in Nocturne Alley instead of Diagon Alley because, right, because the magic couldn't understand him because he didn't enunciate um, correctly. And this scene, honestly, or just this whole idea in general, reminds me of, um, pull in a funny personal story, my kids speaking to Alexa, right? Especially my three-year-old. Um, my three-year-old, it's <laughs> it frustrates her to no end. She just stands there yelling at Alexa, Alexa, play the Frozen 2 soundtrack. And Alexa will just be like, I'm sorry, I can't understand. Um, and <laughs> think, like, I can understand my three-year-old. But artificial intelligence can't because the pronunciation is not correct enough. And so is magic like artificial intelligence? Is it like an Alexa? You have to say it a certain way for it to be understood, for it to be recognized. Um, uh, it's, it's clearly not like a human brain, right? Because the human brain, we can hear a vast number of sounds and interpret it into the correct meaning obviously it takes some of us take practice or take like I can understand my three-year-old but probably most people can't but it's because I spend a lot of time listening to her but I'm just saying the human brain's capable of interpreting a lot of sounds but um artificial intelligence isn't and apparently neither is the magic system right you have to say it correctly um and you know why is that why is that right and related to this idea of correct pronunciation is the idea of meaning what you say. And it's interesting because um, pronunciation still matters. You can't just think in your head and know what you want to say in your head and have the spell come out right, right? But with, con with correct pronunciation, sometimes you need the power of intention behind it too in this system. And this is just a quote from the beginning of that article I had you read. And I think the quote is from, let me check. I think it's from book six. Um, Oh, Order of the Phoenix, book five, I guess. Um, never used an unforgivable curse before, have you, boy? You need to mean them, Potter, right? You have to have uh, intention behind it to use these higher level, more powerful spells. Um, so I'm not going to spoil anything in, for anybody out there. I'm just going to throw this out there. If any of you have seen Onward yet... Um, it's on Disney Plus, the new Disney Pixar movie. If you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. It is a lot of fun. And um, I'm not gonna spoil anything. I'm just gonna say that this idea is crucial to the magic system used in that movie as well. Um, that this idea that it's you can't just say it. You can't, in, and not even just say it correctly. You have to say it with meaning, with intention. But again, what does that mean, right? Um, back to where does the power lie? And clearly in this magic system, it's not just in the words, it's not just in the language, it's in the wizards behind the words. All right, let me just point out a few other things from the book to pay attention to, that I want you to be paying attention to um, when it comes to the power of language. And this first one that I wanna bring up, this is not magic language, this is just thinking about the idea of convention and how language works conventionally. That is with all of us understanding and agreeing how words work. So I wanna talk about the offensive terms of mudblood, mudblood and squib, right? Um, they're both super derogatory terms. Um, they mean nothing to Harry though, right? Because obviously they're only offensive to someone with the cultural knowledge, the understanding of the constructs that lead to them being offensive. Um, 
and this is this is true not just for you know like magical cultures but for anyone who speaks that there's meaning um, that we understand that someone outside of that social construct is not gonna understand and um, it's true not just for the offensive term of blood but like let's let's bring up how we all refer to Voldemort right his name itself is not magical it's not powerful it's it's not but uh, the person behind it and and the the culture and the memories and the the you know like um, society-wide trauma experienced because of what this one wizard did his name became unspeakable um, he who must not be named oh man like you gotta write a paper about that somebody right the power of that of being so terrified of a person that you will not say his name um, and then Harry comes in again without that background without that cultural knowledge and therefore without the fear to say what in the end is just a name right so it's this idea that words have power because we give them power names have power because we let them have power so I mean interesting things to talk about here does that mean that the term mud blood shouldn't be offensive that no one should take offense at it and we can we can translate that to any sort of racial slur or offensive saying in any sort of language should we not should we just say oh it's just a word doesn't matter um, no I'm not saying that I'm not saying that we don't need to let words bother us but I'm saying that sometimes it can be useful um, to to understand that we don't have to let words have power over us that the name Voldemort does not have to hold power right there's some really great quotes about all of that throughout the whole series but right got to be thinking about that idea of um, just conventionally the power that that these non magical words have right um, all right another important Thing from the first half of this book that I want to make sure you're paying attention to and tracking and that we're gonna come back and talk about next week is the voice that voice that Harry keeps hearing for the first time in Gilderoy Lockhart's room when he's serving his detention and then for the second time at the death day party right before the Chamber of Secrets is opened Harry hears that voice and he's the only one who can hear it all right um, those of you who know what this voice is about those of you who've read it all you know we've got to come back and talk about this, right? This is an aspect of magical language that we've got to talk about. So keep tracking that. We'll, we'll come back to that next week. And then one more thing to point out um, is, is to talk about the writing on the wall, right? When that incident actually happens. Now in the book, and maybe I should go back and double check this, but I'm pretty sure in the book, um, Rowling describes the writing just as shining on the wall. She doesn't use a color, as far as I can remember. Again, someone may need to double check me. Um, she just she just describes it as shining, um, which in my mind makes it feel like it's some sort of like magically sparkly metallic-y something or other. That's just me. I had you watch this scene from the movie though, and you'll notice that in the movie, they made the writing red and what does that make us think of obviously blood right um, blood as ink um, coming back to that idea tying us into our dr. Faustus right it's communicating something beyond just the words themselves though right something sinister because the material the red color itself or even the even the shining as it's described in the book that um, that's meant to communicate something about the importance of this writing on the wall. In the fact that it's on the wall and, and all of those things. That that's something I want you to be paying attention to for our discussion next week. The materiality of writing and language in this world. Um, think about the books. Think about the parchments, the quills, the inks, um, all of that, because we are going to be talking about that next week. Uh, and there's so much in there that's really interesting. So just notice these things, pay attention to them, and um, and we'll be back next week for our last discussion, our closing discussion on Harry Potter. Um, 
So for right now, uh, remember to leave your comments below um, and comment on one of your classmates too. You guys have been doing great, really great at super thoughtful comments. I have loved reading through them and seeing the stuff that has come up. So keep it going as best you can. I know it's a poor substitute for, for discussion, but best we can do right now. So keep giving me your great thoughtful comments and talking to each other about this stuff. Um, you can leave a comment about anything you found interesting from today's discussion, from the article, um, or just from the book in general, language or otherwise. Um, whatever you found super fascinating about this book or noticed for the first time or know from your outside knowledge of Harry Potter or whatever, okay? And then final reminder, keep working on your final projects um, because you have drafts in progress due next Monday um, to me. So don't forget about any of that and enjoy finishing off Harry Potter and I can't wait for our discussion next week.